don't know me, my name is Meg Ritzy. I'm with Wheelchair Rugby Canada. Um, I am also a chair for our Gender Equity and Inclusion Working Group, as is Fanny Smith. She's uh, going to be the moderator for this event. Really excited and pleased to see such a great turnout for this uh, discussion today. We've got a great uh, group of uh, panelists on deck who are really keen to share their knowledge and expertise in this uh, really cool area. So without further ado, I'm just going to start this off with a land acknowledgement. So oh, again, everyone, if we don't mind going on mute. <laughs> All right. So Wheelchair Rugby Canada wishes to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on here today, understanding that we have people here from coast to coast to coast, uh, and we acknowledge the importance of the lands on which we call home and work from. We reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving our relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. We acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nation people that call this land home. So, really quickly, I just want to introduce our moderator, Fanny Smith. Fanny has been uh, in the para sport and adaptive sport world since late 2010, and she really found her passion in this space. She is the uh, manager for, um, oops, excuse me. She is the manager of para development with Athletics Canada and is also director for the board of directors for us here at Wheelchair Rugby Canada. So I've had the pleasure of knowing Fanny for quite a while now. She's also a member of our GEID working group, as I've just mentioned. And uh, her passion lies in a continuous learning journey in developing awareness and tools to understand the systematic barriers in sport better as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we really couldn't have asked for a better individual to uh, shape this discussion today. So with that, Fanny, I'm going to pass the baton off to you. Great. Thanks, uh, Meg. I'm so excited for today. This was um, a combined effort of all our GE, GEID group, um, which I've, I've seen your names pop up. So I think most of you are on the call. So thanks for joining us today. And um, just as I said right before, a few a few last minute people joined us. We we are recording. Uh, we ask you to be on mute. You can have your camera on or off. And today we really are, you know, wanting to have a discussion around some of these these elements that um, kind of relate to women's health or or people um, with uterus is health in sport, out of sport. And I think we gathered just so many great um, people on our panel today. Nandini is going to be joining us um, as soon as she can can figure out Teams, which for some reason is so much harder than some of the other platforms. But we'll let her in when she shows up and, and I'll have Meg pin her for us. Uh, I really want to kind of like engage in the conversation and leave the conversation, but I'm really going to be um, hoping that people ask questions and um, engage and, and we're looking at this more like a kind of like a fireside chat versus like a Q&A of all these great experts. Um, sorry, it's lunch hour behind me, so it's a little bit noisy. Um, so I will start by basically asking all of our great guests to introduce themselves um, in a few sentences to give you a better idea of what their area of expertise and passion is um, from their own words so we can kind of like um, spin off from there on the conversation. So we'll just start at the top of the of the of the slide here. Joanne, just reminding you to, to speak a bit louder because you're we were struggling with your mic a little bit earlier. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks so much for having me. Tell me if I need to speak any louder or if I am indeed shouting at you all. Um, I'm Joanna Perkins. I'm the head physio for Welsh Women's National Rugby Squad. Um, I actually used to work in men's rugby for nearly a decade. Had my two children and realised there was absolutely no support at that time um, in getting back into, into sport. Um, incontinence seemed to just be deemed as something we didn't talk about or was normal. Um, as was, was breast health, menstrual cycle support. So I, I retrained in everything female health and um, have been with the, the Women's National Squad for the, the last five years and have recently written the um, World Rugby Postnatal Guidelines alongside um, Izzy Moore, who's on the as well.
just said unmute. Thank you. You're muted, Fanny. Um, great. Thank you so much, Joanne. Um, Dr. Koros, up to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Kim Koros. I'm a physical medicine and rehab physician working in Toronto. Um, on my day to day, I work with inpatients uh, on the neurologic rehab unit at Bridgepoint. Uh, and then I also do high performance sports medicine through CSIO and Athletics Canada. Um, I've traveled with teams to the last few Para Pan American Games, um, Paralympics in Tokyo, and I will be uh, attending the Paralympics in Paris as well. Great, thank you so much. Sorry, just getting uh, an ND sorted here. Uh, Dr. Ann, um, can you introduce yourself as well? Thank you. Sure. Um, so I'm Ann Brindle, and I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist, which means I'm an obstetrician um, that takes care of more medically complex or high risk pregnancies. Um, I'm at Sunnybrook in Toronto as well, and I'm the director of the Accessible Care Pregnancy Clinic. So my um, area of focus and expertise is on uh, pregnancy for people with physical disability. And so I see a lot of people with spinal cord injuries, cerebral palsy, uh, spina bifida, myasthenia gravis, um, people who have been in car accidents or have had physical trauma, pelvic fracture, this sort of thing. So um, helping these individuals have, have a safe pregnancy. And the part that I really like best about my job is meeting all these amazing people um, who go on to have happy and healthy families, um, but also working with a really amazing interdisciplinary team um, when we're trying to provide this care. So it's a, a really uh, unique and, and interesting area, and I really enjoy it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, our next person is Melanie, and I'll take this opportunity to say that um, both Melanie and I, and probably a few others, on parle en français. Alors, s'il y a des gens qui préfèrent demander leurs questions en français ou on peut traduire de l'information, s'il vous plaît, nous laissez le savoir. Melanie, à toi. Merci, Fanny. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Melanie Labelle. I am a wheelchair rugby uh, athlete on the national team. Um, some people may know me already, uh, but what you might not know about me already is that when I sustained my spinal cord injury in 2016, I turned 30 and I had already started seeing my life um, and giving a lot of um, interest in long-term health or quality of life uh, as I was aging. So as I started having um, interest in that then, and when I sustained my injury, it became a focus for me to understand how I would age in this condition and what the quality of life could look like and what are the actions I can take today to help. We are all going to die someday, but I wanted to help the quality of life as I was aging. So starting to educate myself around um, the stages a woman will go through in her life is something I was really curious about. So that's what I'm bringing in today. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Moore, off, um, you're with us. If you can introduce yourself as well, please. Thank you, Fanny. Uh, so I'm Dr. Isabel Moore. I'm an associate professor in human movement and sport medicine at Cardiff Metropolitan University. And I do um, a lot of research in kind of injury risk and how and why we move the way that we do. I've worked uh, with the Welsh Rugby Union in particular for about 10 years now and we have typically focused quite a lot on the men's side of the game and in the past few years we've, we've managed to switch our focus somewhat to the female athlete which kind of coincided with me focusing a lot in particularly postpartum return to exercise and having gone through a pregnancy and postpartum period myself I have a, a screaming toddler down the corridor uh, who's, who's two now so it gave me a unique insight into the real lack of information and has really kind of spurred me spurred me on from my p personal experiences to improve the research and knowledge base that we have because it's it's severely lacking uh in in that field and like joe said well joe scribbled a few notes on uh across a diet on a dining room uh ch chat that we once had saying wouldn't it be great to put some guidelines together and a year's worth of work later um we've now got the got the guidelines together so that was a, a real passion project and it'll, it'll be great to discuss bits of that today 
excellent. I love that. And Nandini, right on time. I know you're just getting on. I can't see you, but I'm going to ask Meg to find you and pin you. Okay. And I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> hi, <laughs> thanks for joining. Hi. Um, I just was asking all of our kind of speakers today to quickly introduce themselves, kind of, um, you know, what uh, you do in sport and kind of just what you know, women in sport means to you and and uh, and what you're, you know, you want to talk about today. We're we're really kind of positioning this as more of a fireside chat than a Q&A. So perfect timing then. <laughs> okay, amazing. Sorry, I am just bobbled right now. I just got off the track. <laughs> um, <laughs> my name is Nathalie Sharma. I'm a 254 wheelchair racer. Uh, and that's really about it. <laughs> Uh, I compete for Team Canada. I, I've been on two national teams now, so I'm still fairly new, I guess, in that sense. But um, I think I'm pretty passionate about women in sport, especially like coming from a sledge hockey background. I played pro ice hockey before, and like seeing the inequality in sport through there, and then seeing the development of that sport makes me like a little more intrigued in this topic, at least. And uh, definitely like becoming a single sport athlete and understanding the physiology of my body at like a higher level um just really it makes it a lot more important to me <laughs> seeing how like my body functions differently than everyone else's awesome excellent that's good um I wanted to start the conversation kind of segueing a little bit about what um Dr. Moore said around just the the lack of knowledge, the lack of research that that was around just women's bodies and our cycles and not just women, but just the cycle of the uterus, the life cycle of of how that presents itself, you know, in uh, adolescence and then through pregnancy and post-pregnancy and hello, premenopause, whole different like world. And just the 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 you know, the, the conversations that we are comfortable or not comfortable having and, you know, um, having been in the sport world for, for, you know, over a decade now, you are seeing the conversation changing just around whether you're talking about your coach, about your menstruation, you know, cycle and, and how it affects you or doesn't affect you or um, the impact of returning to sport in whatever role that is um, after having a baby, the, um, you know, change in accommodations for breastfeeding parents, um, all those different things. And so from your perspective, like, have you have you seen like the impact of whether it's your research or just like more information being infused into the system now, um, the conversation is changing? I'm certainly noticing it, but, um, you know, more from a personal level. Um, so I'd just be curious to see if, if you saw that shift through your research um, or because of your research, I guess. Uh, it's great to kick off with. Um, I, it, there's there's quite a few statistics out there of just the general lack of research in female athletes. So there's a statistic people use where about only 6% of uh, the participants involved in research in sports science and medicine are female participants or the research is female focused um and that you know obviously that's not good enough we we see that also then transfer across into the who are the academics leading these projects and they're typically men as well so it's kind of right through the the system uh, I do think that a change is it's certainly becoming more prevalent in terms of uh, just say conferences. They will have now a lot more talks on female specific content. Um, I think we've still got a way to go because they're often shunted into this you know, female arena uh, rather than just being just commonplace in every session. Uh, so people can still, oh, I just won't go to those sessions. I don't want to, it's a little bit where, whenever you do like EDI talks, you know, mm -hmm. you, you're often preaching to the converted already because they come <laughs> and they turn up. So uh, it's getting there, but it's still at a quite a, a, let's call it a glacial pace. And often a lot of women having to drive it and move that, that needle forward. So 
we are getting more allies in that space. And the issue though we do battle with is there's a lot that we need to do and getting good high quality research done takes time. And so we need to be mindful that often that there are more research kind of being put out in that space. Sometimes it's not always the best, it's just the quickest. And that's sort of what we found when just trying to put these guidelines together. There's just so little to draw on. So it's great that more conversations are happening. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have the evidence base like we do in, in the men's side to, to be putting these guidelines together with really evidence informed. It's more clinically informed, which is great, but we really also want that evidence base to start building as well. Yeah. And I imagine that, you know, it, it's hard enough to get into this you know, female driven space that as, as soon as you add any other intersectionality to the equation, it becomes even, even an additional um, piece that needs to be kind of broken down. Um, I, again, just want to say if people have questions, please jump in. Like my brain is bubbling with a few different things that I want to ask myself. So I'll, I'll ask my next question and then hope that people will be inspired to ask their own. But I wanted to uh, um, ask Dr. Dr. Ann around, um, you know, the, the barrier, not the barriers, but it's kind of some of the changes, I guess, or the progress that has been made around um, accessible access or access to healthcare for, for people with disabilities. And do you find that um, there is just as much advocating as to maybe when you started or is that changing the conversation and is is it kind of like helping again like from a research perspective starting to change um the the research that's being done around that area so um you know when you're talking about the sort of intersectionality which you're which you're discussing is always really really challenging and the uh you know if you already have you know people who can get pregnant you know pregnancy itself people with disabilities accessibility there's so many spaces that you're trying to to work with there to find um, some really good information about about a population that really needs some some specialized care but also just an ability to get access to that care so um you know when i when i started the clinic here at sunnybrook uh, there really was not another specific clinic uh, for for pregnancy and disability in in canada um, in ubc there was a really good clinic specifically for um, spinal cord injury so there was uh, some really good progress and there's some great people working out there in ubc on this as well uh, but we wanted something that was a little bit more more generalized for the population and when we started um, it was even hard to find places Places to use as examples. We were looking at different uh, centers. The, the Center for Independent Living Toronto was a really great resource in terms of helping to direct us, in terms of giving us good information. Um, when we did a survey of our space, we found that some of our washrooms were not accessible. Uh, we found that we had, you know, specific challenges in like ultrasound provision, like how do we do good fetal ultrasound for someone who needs to transfer out of a wheelchair or has a power chair? How are we going to get them in and out of rooms in a way that we can still provide really high quality uh, information for that person about their pregnancy? So there was a lot of like technical pieces that we had to work with. Um, but the, the nice thing is that there were a lot of people who were very excited about it. Uh, Studybrook did invest in making changes uh, in terms of having a Hoyer lift, uh, a ceiling Hoyer lift installed. Um, we have a dedicated clinic space. We have people who are really interested in it and a great team of people to work with, which is a big piece of it. Um, so I'm feeling that change locally, but it's really hard for me to know what's happening at other centers. So, you know, I can I can see what's happening here. I do get questions from other centers. How would I manage this? How, you know, what would I do here? But from like an infrastructure perspective, I think we're just at the really at the beginning. The thing that I'm I'm kind of excited about though is that I get a lot of questions from learners. So meaning medical students, residents, people like, oh, this is a cool place of you know of intersectionality. There's something I'm really interested in. This is something I want to advocate for and change. And so I'm I'm quite enthusiastic that there's going to be people coming up in the next generation who are just more aware of what's going on um, and more aware of implementing accessibility throughout spaces wherever they end up landing you know if it's going to be um, you know an ob gyn focused uh, area or another area just the importance of accessibility um, you know in everybody's day-to-day -day life and everybody's uh, field of medicine that they end up 
end up getting into. Um, we have some new guidelines that are coming out through the Provincial Council of Maternal and Child Health that just came out and they uh, give some some ideas on how other centers can try to make their spaces more accessible. So I'm hoping that that will also now that we have more of a provincial um, uh, broadcast of, of how we manage the clinic and what we did to set it up that other people are going to be uh, feeling more supported in doing a similar thing. But it's it's a it's a hard space. I do feel it's moving forward, though. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything to add on this or we can uh, kind of change topic or open it up um, even from questions within the speakers or, or the audience. I don't know if anybody has anything to add to that particular point. I mean, I, if, I, if, oh, sorry, I was just going to say if anyone is shy about speaking up, you're more than welcome to use the chat function or you can hit raise your hand along the top bar as well if you're worried about interrupting and we'll get to you. Yeah, thanks. I was just going to add from a sports medicine perspective, full disclosure, I went into physiatry, like there's two ways to get into sports medicine, largely. One is through family medicine and one is through another specialty. And I opted to avoid family medicine to avoid women's health. So the fact that I'm sitting on a panel like from women's health, the irony is not lost on me. Um, but I think it spe speaks to the need and, and the gap that was there. Um, there's very few women in high performance sports medicine. And so what I found was just by being the female who works in a sports medicine space, females felt more comfortable coming to me with issues around female anatomy and um, function. And um, that's how, uh, you know, I've identified some of the gaps within the systems. I'm super excited to hear about people like Dr. Berndahl in their clinic because, you know, to add um, the issues in women's sport, plus accessibility, as you mentioned, it's just another layer. Um, and, and I'm super excited to see it continue to grow. But the biggest thing I've seen is, is the openness in conversation. Like the fact that we're all sitting here around the table talking about women's health, you know, eight years ago when I started, that, that wouldn't have been a thing. People would come to me almost in an embarrassed way to say that they missed two, three days of training a month as a standard because they were suffering with menstrual dysfunction. Um, and and now I think women and women in sport are demanding more. And um, and I think that's a really exciting place to be. Yeah. Yeah. The conversation itself, I think, has changed. I mean, um, I've been on a few mission teams and you're basically on site for five weeks. So everybody knows how long a cycle is. And I remember someone, a male on our big group, made a comment and I was like, well, there's 10 women and we're here for five weeks. Multiple people will have their period while we're here. And it was just like, what? Like this whole, like, you know, we weren't going to talk about it. And I was like, no, we're going to go to the, we're going to need to find a shop to buy some products at some point in time. So I think it's, it's funny. Even I have, you know, had to, to be more comfortable and, and I'm raising two boys and just be like, it's natural. Like, I don't want you here, like to hear you go, ew, because it is what it is. And as their friends are starting to, you know, hit that that point of time in their life, I want them to be supportive and not like, you know, make fun of of the girls or be like, oh, on your period because they have, you know, whatever symptoms are, are coming forth. So it's it's interesting you say that because, I, you know, I've certainly seen that shift. <clears throat> I'm going to um, ask Nandini. I on the last panel that you spoke of, you kind of talked a little bit about your experience talking about this. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on because I thought it was such a great story that you told. And I wonder if you would uh, share it with us today. Yeah. Do you know what I'm so. talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to assume, I, I think I know, but um, <laughs> it's like recently uh, I've definitely like dived into understanding my period a bit more. And I think it's an important topic for coaches to understand if they're coaching female athletes. And recently I went to Dubai and we had a competition and the day before I felt like hell. <laughs> and then the next day I got my period and I had a two second PB. And like, I agree, like training is going great and everything can click and everything can work. But like, there is a secret and there is something to learn about the menstrual cycle and I feel like that needs to be focused on a bit more there needs to be a little more like research done on it especially like in a coaching situation like there needs to be a little more um 
like understanding between the athlete and the coach and a little more communication along the lines of that as well so I feel like there's like untapped knowledge and untapped like energy so like not even a point of like understanding like okay like I'm gonna feel bad or I'm gonna be in pain or whatever it is but there is like a secret to use this into performing better as well I'm assuming that's a story you were talking about. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, and also like it's different from everyone, but even just 100%. um I think it was during that panel where where a coach, a male coach asked, "Well, how do you how do you ask someone about it? How do you have that conversation to to ask, you know, again, make it like someone's going to get their period during a month's training mm-hmm. camp or whatever it is." And so how do you have the conversation with a coach or how does a male coach have a conversation? I remember um, like one of the points that Kendra, who was on the panel as well, like pointed out was like having that coach specifically coached many female athletes and she pointed out having like kind of a captain in that team for someone to talk to. And like Dr. Kroos is just saying like she came into this space and it became more open for females to talk to her about it. Mm -hmm. I feel like having that like having a person there that makes women feel more comfortable in discussing their period is step one but then also like just throwing it out there and being like this is for a coaching perspective this is important like men need to understand that it's not weird (laughs) like it's just the body that's just how we work and that's it you know and I feel like if that stigma gets broken it makes it a little bit easier I've definitely I said that in that last panel as well, that, like, I go out of my way to, like, make my male, like, teammates uncomfortable. <laughs> like, I'm like, you guys have to get over this. Like, it's not, it just is what it is. So, like, why am I, why am I getting uncomfortable by the situation? Therapy through exposure, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Mel, I don't know if you have anything to add from that from also a female athlete perspective in a, in a male's world. Makes me smile, though, because <laughs> I... I I don't keep it in. I talk to them about it. <laughs> the boys will know, but um, you know, I when I uh, when I was first injured, um, I didn't understand how much the cycle would affect me as a quadriplegic at all. I just I didn't know. So I was going through the motions and and having a lot of anxiety from complications due to quadriplegia not understanding that those complications weren't complications, they were just me going through my cycle. And for for example, having very, very low blood pressure on certain days, and I, to this day, I could predict the, the day where it's gonna happen uh, because I count my cycle and I go through it and I can predict it. What happened was pandemic. During pandemic, I could not play rugby and I had all of this, time in the world at home isolated and I had a bike on a roller and I just humored it I was like okay let's go this is day one and I went through the cycle kind of witnessing and noting down my and I I only I only know Mel I don't have data for everybody but I know Mel the athlete and what this is for as I'm supposed to be joining this late but in mind <laughs> so um I just went through the whole cycle and through multiple ones because pandemic for me was two years almost. <laughs> and and I, I, I swear, I, there is a 48 period where half of my strength is gone. There is, um, I could predict exactly where I'm going to overheat. And this exactitude is kind of depending on where I'm at, I am in the cycle, depending on ovulation through period. I kind of have all of this weird data about me. And then I brought it to my performance in rugby and the anxiety part to to pain and to uh, low blood pressure and to low blood sugar or needing to eat more or like the, the nutrition part of it was kind of lowered because I knew exactly where to be on what day. But there is a certain aspect, which is pain or severe type of pain that women could experience that this on some level, when it happens, I can't hide it. I would usually be at home and hide away and not talk to anyone. But when I'm at the boys, they suffer with it through me, yeah, through it with me because I can't, like, I can't talk. I, I just, tears are running down my cheeks and it, they, they wouldn't know why or how much in pain I am, but it's so severe. And all I could tell them is just make me laugh, make me forget about it. 
And then they look at me with all of this compassion. They're so good with me, by the way. Um, all of this compassion. And they're like, there's one thing I don't want to be is disabled, but disabled woman is kind of the next thing that I, I don't really want to be. Like it's to them, they, they kind of go through it with me. But it's, it's funny. I just, I can't hide it. I mean, I just can't. Thank you for that. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, right. We like, why, why do we always need to hide it? But um, thanks for both of your input on that. Jo Joanne, I could see you like nodding through um, the conversation. I don't know if stuff was coming up or you were just kind of like appreciating what Mel was sharing. Oh, no, Mel, literally everything you just said is my passion with, with female sport. And I've, I've really only worked with male who you know, ended up in women's sport to share that we might be able to use our cycle as a as a performance drive just literally blows their mind and because the the science and the research like Izzy said hasn't quite caught up for me there's no way that we can have all these subjective sensations and feelings and it not affect how we like develop our strength our muscle mass we know what estrogen and progesterone do um and it's a it's a real big drive of mine that we adapt our training programs for exactly what you're saying. You know, we know when if we're not feeling as strong, we're not going to be as strong. And I'm exactly the same as you. Phase two, and typically, I think there was a study, the, um, the Australian team of para athletes and body athletes, all of them said if they could pick their day for competition, they would choose just after their period. That can't just be a coincidence, can it? You know, and um, there's some brilliant studies that are going to be coming out later this year that hopefully show that and, and that's why I'm nodding away because I'm like that if we're feeling that that's exactly what's happening and um you know we've got to get coaches on board sports scientists and strength and conditioners on board that you know we maybe we adapt things in different phases um and that's good and it's okay and a period is a, a good thing we want we want us to be having a period each month unless you were pregnant or a, on a contraception so um yeah no I'm, I'm nodding away because it's something I'm really passionate about too and and I, I was laughing, I can't remember who was uh, who was talking about it, but I was actually on um on a concussion in women's panel today. And exactly when we're saying men perhaps don't understand or ask the ridiculous questions. And a, one of them said to me, um, oh, do women get concussions on their period because their necks get thinner? And I literally just laughed at his eye. And I was like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But I was like, but he was so interested. I thought, actually, you know, this guy's trying to learn. Um, and he said, oh, do you, do you all get calf strains when you ovulate? I was like, I, I'm literally <laughs> mind blown about what you're saying to me, but I think that's exactly we've got to, we've got to have those conversations to um, to educate everyone, haven't we? And not just uh, uh, yeah. Wow. Say, right? <laughs> Honestly, that's so like... that's so interesting. I hope that I hope that we do see more research because I think there's a lot of anecdotes around um, how it impacts. And uh, I was laughing with my doctor yesterday because. I had a concussion in 2019, which probably coincided with me entering my premenopause state. And I just started um, hormone therapy and my brain fog went away. The brain fog I thought was associated with my concussion, which was like premenopause symptoms. And I was like, oh, so that's why they gave women lobotomies like back in the 40s for premenopause <laughs> because I just wanted the pressure of my brain to go away like this whole time. Meanwhile, I was low on estrogen. So <laughs> it's uh, it's I think a learning for for so many of us in this space. Um, we have a couple comments in the chat um, that I think are really good. I, uh, you know, um, Mikiko shares that male coaches or teammates don't necessarily have to be the ones to talk about it, but it's good for the athletes to know that they have knowledge and that they're open to talk about it. And I think that, you know, that's a really good point. Um, I think even just, you know, making this like, like in anything, right? Like making a safe space for people to be able to, to come to you or to, to talk about uh, whatever topics and um, someone suggests an app, which I've never heard of. Um, but it's called Fitter Woman app. I don't know if anybody has experience with that app on here. Yeah, no, I have. It's it's a good app actually. It's um we used to use it before Vodafone have created something more individual, but it's it's a free app, it's good, and it gives you you can log as much or as little as you want, but it gives um diet advice through each phase as well as 
is it an advice what you know what different strength and conditioning you might do for each one so um yeah i'd certainly recommend it excellent excellent do we have um any other questions or comments from the chat or from any of our our audience or speakers or do i come up with some other question to throw at you there is a book that just came out you you spoke about the hormone replacement therapy and yeah i'm I'm looking at the brain fog that you're talking about and <laughs> i'm starting to see or to experience some of those things like i'm i'm turning 39 and <laughs> obviously my cycles are not um giving me the same symptoms so i take them as they come and i try to witness what's going on um but there's definitely a switch and it's like I will be on a three months good and then two months very, very bad. And, and like so I'm trying to to start reading or start getting a vocabulary around like what do I bring to my professional in terms of how can we work with this like teamwork or or talk like get this conversation going so I could be preventative and reaching the menopause. And then I uh, there's Mary Claire uh, Haver who's an uh, OBGYN in the USA. She's also a nutritionist and she just came out with a book, book called The New Menopause. And she has, it's called the Pause Life a website where um, she's getting this very, very big conversation going about menopause, but the, sim the, the whole, whole phase. So perimenopause, menopause and postmenopausal health. And, and there, it, it's a whole way of life with, between nutrition, habits and, and kind of symptoms to look for. And um, basically she is, she saw that there was a gap and she started to kind of try to bridge it where she was and then received a lot of patients and now trying to find other um, professionals. So on her website, you could actually go and find uh, resources onto where you are. So I could find that in Canada, there's Ontario and Alberta, there's, uh, all, all sorts of uh, people that are on this website website that I could find. Quebec is not in there yet, but it is a community. So it's building with the people finding um, professionals that work for them or that have the conversation and we're willing to work with them through aging. So I, I think that this is, I could maybe chat the, the, the link to her website. Yeah, that'd be great. It's, it's called the new menopause and it's really just a, a good tool, I think, to start the conversation if you're having questions or if you want to know where the research is about hormone therapy and estrogens and stuff like that. But for my personal life as an SCI and an athlete and a woman, uh, I know that we are going to go through this it's already bone strong. And so some made and smell so freezing for anyone else okay <laughs> mel you're freezing oh, just a little nice. bit we might pause your your thought there for a minute uh until you come back am i back your, your voice is no. your voice is <laughs> i'm back okay sorry where where did i leave uh no. I think if you were going to drop the information in the chat is where I lost you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was, I was talking about the impact of SCI and bone density loss and going through menopause, which is also a bone density loss driver and using HRT as a preventative way to prevent that, that bone loss basically that we are going to experience with already weak bones. So there's no study on this, but it's a it's a thought or um, something that I was curious about to see where the medicine is going to go with that, with the SCI angle, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. I think kind of going back to that earlier question with um, Dr. Ann around how, you know, the conversation, the intersectionality conversation in like, say, pregnancy, I think, you know, hopefully it will see a change on on the other end. My my son was asking me what was wrong with me when I was like having hot flashes and I was trying to explain to him what it was. And I was like, it's kind of like reverse 
puberty like that was the best way I could describe it to him in the moment and he's like oh okay <laughs> and so just kind of like you know it's it's a whole cycle of 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 stuff that we go through and then you add you know disability or gender identity or race or sport components and it's it's a whole baggage of different things that um, it's exciting to see the research and more specialty in that area and, and all those pieces. So I'm excited to see us have this conversation when we're, for myself, post-menopause and, and uh, looking back on, on these conversations now that the story has changed a little bit. So that would be good. Um, all right. Um, any um, questions from our audience or anything? Oh, thanks, Mel. Oh, she just shared that there. We'll definitely look that one up. Um, from any other athletes in the in the crowd or any um, you know male attendees or anybody that might have some questions. Um, I have a question, and maybe this is for Dr. Berndel, or maybe it's for some of the athletes themselves, but um, I think one trend, the first trend I saw when I started sports medicine was like people were coming to me with talk of their menstrual cycles. Um, and, uh, you know, we've mentioned there's not a ton of research there. I, I would say now I'm starting to see more people come to me with questions about fertility preservation. Um, because as athletes, their careers are taking longer, or they're just like, their fertile years happen to be their competitive years. And so I guess this is this question is maybe directed to Dr. Berger or, or, or the athletes or the rest of the panel. Like, is this a concern that's um, present for everyone? And um, yeah, what's what's been everyone's experience in trying to navigate that if they feel comfortable sharing? Because I think the accessibility piece for sure um, is another layer there. So I can I can speak to that just for more of the, you know, I only see people once they're pregnant for the most part. So I don't do the reproductive endocrinology end of things. So once people are pregnant or if they have questions about what they might anticipate a pregnancy might look like for that individual in terms of, you know, how am I going to be feeling? What's birth going to look like for me? Then then I'll talk to them from that end. But I have been really fortunate to to work with a fellow who's a reproductive endocrinologist um, who did a nice study on spinal cord injury and outcomes in um, people who use reproductive technologies and found that people had really great outcomes. So, um, you know, I think that it's it was more of a piece in that there wasn't any data in this area. There's not a lot of people who are included in this study. It was from a data set, um, but but people had good outcomes. And the, the driving of this and the reason she was doing this is she was thinking that we needed to make uh, reproductive endocrinology and fertility spaces more accessible as well. So I think this also just speaks to people are interested. Like I see this new generation of of people coming up um, through medicine who want to make spaces more accessible. So there's that end of it. I've also seen a lot of people um, through the accessibility clinic who have used reproductive technologies, um, people who are a single parent by choice. Uh, so I think that it's, it's a very viable option for a lot of people to make use of those technologies. In terms of um, fertility preservation, um, I wouldn't be the right person to ask about, about that in terms of any detail, but um, my my thought process on it would be that uh, it wouldn't be different from any other person um, of that age of the same you know sort of health status otherwise if someone if someone had a spinal cord injury um, but you know I would defer that to to my REA colleagues to give a more exacting answer on it but um, I've seen I've seen many people who've made made use of it and we've had really good outcomes. It's a great question. I think you're right. I think most women will enter their most competitive years um, during that same year where they're expected to have babies. And so how how do you balance that? Uh, Nan, you came off mute. Do you have something you wanted to add? Sorry. I was just thinking like literally yesterday I was talking to my mom about this and I was just like, I think I want to freeze my eggs because I, I want to stay in sport for longer. I don't know if I want children. I think this is like actually a consuming thought that it ruins my life <laughs> constantly I think about it and I don't know if I want kids I don't know if like it's I don't know I just don't know but I know that I definitely want to be in sport for longer and the idea that there's a timeline on either end of it is very scary to me so just the fact that that was even brought up was insane 
and I've been having this conversation like a lot recently <laughs> just because I am 26 but I don't I think I'm a child there's no way I could have a child <laughs> so like the idea that the my best years in sport are going to be around the same time that I would be I suppose ready to have a child is insane mm-hmm. yeah just an extra layer of something to think about on top of what does it look like if I want to return to sport? What does it look like if mm -hmm. I need to travel with my child to compete afterwards and, and all those things? Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Like, especially that as well, like knowing um, I had a coach and she had a baby and like, and that she had to have someone there to take care of the child. Like it couldn't just be her. She couldn't just have the baby on the track as well. Like that entire process, watching her go through that, it was, honestly pretty horrific I was like this is very scary to like witness and kind of see how you get alienated throughout that process as well so like imagining having my own child and still wanting to participate in sport is like it's scary for sure mm -hmm. yeah yes Meg yeah, you know, it's just this has all the gears of my brain turning quite a bit right now. And uh, we kind of touched on it uh, with regards to, like, you know, fertility and whatnot. But I'm thinking of, like, you know, fertility treatments. And I don't know if any of our pa panelists would have expertise or even anecdotal experience in this. But, you know, they're very um, uh, intense for a lot of people who go through them. You know, you're, you, you are... Uh, it's tiring and it's it's emotional and it can for some people they might be more private about it and I, it would be I'd be really curious to know how different athletes if they're undergoing that you know from a training perspective how they navigate that space with their peers and their coaches if they are open about that. I'm happy to leave space for athletes to talk but recognizing it's a it's a pretty personal um, space for people. I would say like anecdotally what I've seen of athletes is just it requires a lot more pre-planning. Oh, I think she froze. <laughs> we left out a pre-planning there, but yeah. Uh, yeah, and just, yeah, anecdotally speaking, it would be uh, an interesting topic to hear from people, what they've seen from other, <laughs> other sports. <laughs> I was about, I mean, I can, I don't have much, I only have my own anecdotal story, having gone through it myself. Um, and yeah, it requires a lot of planning. It is, I've probably been the most like uh, angry and uh, I was not a good person to be around through lots of the, the hormones and so on. Uh, I was, I think somewhat fortunate I did some of that during lockdown so I didn't have to expose many people to that that side of me but just even working during that process and we uh, we kept it very secret we didn't tell anyone um it does take its its toll I would say of uh, the highs and the lows of of everything and, and we had a we were lucky, but I guess fortunately, and he had needed one cycle. But you know, if you, that is a repeat, prolonged uh, experience, it's it's emotionally draining to to go through, and um, very hard, I think, to discuss it because it is a very personal decision. Uh, and so, I know, for example, just from my experience, and this isn't really in athletes, but just from the working world. We have a policy saying that we should discuss it or, you know, we can discuss it with our line manager, who was a, a man who had, uh, let's just say, he wasn't the most com known compassionate man. And uh, there was no way I was ever going to do that until I was, you know, at the point of pregnancy and needing to disclose it. So it, I think it's a difficult space to have those conversations as well, as well as the financial implications of it. Um, which of course will probably vary by different countries, but it's, uh, it's definitely not a cheap option. No, absolutely. Um, Erica, I see your hand up. I think it's you. Hold on, I think she's muted. I'm just gonna, oh, it's not letting me unmute her. I'm wondering if she's driving oh, or Erica. something. <laughs> she's good. I can see her on. Erica? Okay. Yeah, one second. I just 
I'm in my car and I dropped my phone, but I got something to add to this conversation. Just give me one second. Take your time. Don't crash. Okay, there we go. Um, so some of the people on the panel do know me. My name is Erica Schmutz. I was, um, I'm a C6, C7 complete quadriplegic. I was on the national team from around 2000, wheelchair rugby national team from 2005 to uh, around 2012. And um, as a woman, I'm, right now I'm 51, but I've gone through a lot of these issues you guys are bringing up and I'm so glad that you are. It was never talked about while I was an athlete. It was, you kept quiet, you just kept your head down and you just dealt with it. And now that I'm so proud that these are out there and being shared and known. Um, for the person that was thinking about getting pregnant, I was 41 when I had my daughter. And I did go through a couple of years of IVF and I was still trying to be on the national team at the same time. And I kept it quiet from them because it wasn't talked about. Uh, going through the ups and downs and there was a couple of people I could talk to, but in general, I just didn't say anything because I didn't know what would happen. Um, I did have to retire after I had my daughter, mostly because I couldn't spend that much time away from her. Camps were a month long. Travel would be a month away. And a lot of the guys, they'd have kids and sure, they had no problem trying over the team next year because they knew their wives would be taking care of the child. I, I love my husband, but I don't know if I'd trust him a month with a newborn. So... There's there's a lot of different things like that that come into uh, consideration when it's the female trying to do a lot of these things. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Erica. It kind of echoes um, a couple of the comments that came through, um, you know, kind of echoing or, uh, you know, saying that Nandi hit on something important as, you know, women are trying to come back into a coaching role specifically or or back into you know, the workforce after having kids and Makiko, you know, shared her own personal experience going through treatment and just kind of, you know, adding to the fact of, of going through that while you're, you're training as Erica just shared. So um, I think, you know, maybe this is something for our team to bring, um, to bring as an action item, Meg, where Makiko says, it'd be nice to hear more experiences. Like, can we gather some more written experiences of people that might want to share, because I think that um, we're opening a conversation that maybe people didn't know, you know, is okay to have and, and want to share. I think the, the spaces are changing very slowly, but they are changing around um, accommodations uh, for people to return, whether it's to coaching or or to training with kids and it's always tends to be this balance around financial constraints and you know high performance environments and the travel and all these types of pieces which i think we had covid adding all sorts of, of different kind of layers of complications um we're seeing some great stuff out of um i don't know if they've done it for both the side both sides olympic and paralympics but you know, France is now allowing breastfeeding mothers to stay out of the village during the Olympic Games. Um, and so there are some countries and some sports that are making changes. Wheelchair rugby had a, a great, um, very progressive, innovative um, maternity, uh, return for maternity leave. I, I can't remember what the name exactly is called. Um, when we had a staff return and, and some accommodations around you know, having their child, um, having a caregiver come to support su support her return to work with a child. So, I think that's a, a definitely a, a great topic of conversation and and one that um, elicits a lot of emotion and frustration. And you know, Lisa shares that she, or Jen, someone sh Jen shared that she had to leave coaching for nine years. Um, so, I think it's it's um, it's certainly hard, and there's a lot more work that needs to be done there. Um, and yet as an administrator, which um, it, it definitely is not the same constraints, I've seen a lot of changes too where, um, and I think I think COVID and the Zoom nation of work, everyone working at home has, has allowed for this change. But even the fact that my, you know, kid was home from lunch earlier and making noise in the background, like you would have never, that that would have to be like so much hidden or, you know, I have a toddler coming up on my calls with my boss and my colleagues all the time. And, and that's becoming a little bit more. Okay. Like we are parents outside of, um, 
our lives, right? Or 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 whatever it may be. So hopefully that continues to go in a more even more progressive um, area as we as we move forward in this world and in the sports system. Um, so lots of great conversations. I love this. We still have some time allocated if if people have some questions and want to continue any of the top topic of conversations. Um, I'll, I'll kind of pause and allow someone to chime in if they want. I was just going to say that there's like a really big push for having uh, female coaches be a part of sport. Like there's always like even with Athletics Canada, the panel that we were just on, that whole camp was supporting female coaches and female athletes. And there needs to be a better understanding that this is a process that might happen, might not. But, you know, like there needs to be definitely like a more progressive approach. The fact that there isn't already a system is pretty insane, honestly. Like there needs to be more support for sure. Oh, I just can't believe that like it's taken this long for something like that to come about. You're not wrong. Your rugby, though. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong for sure. I mean, we just have to keep the conversations open. Anyone else have some questions for our great panel or speakers want to add their their own experience or to the conversation go on a different topic? Uh, Casey, yes. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody for, for sharing. Um, and I think it would be like, I don't know, I just envision a really cool um uh, like documentary or movie about all of these collective experiences throughout um the journey through sport throughout the different ages um and stages that uh, women with with disability or i mean we we always hear about these really great um stories of women after they've had their baby and coming back and it's just like they have so much more um i don't know i i i since having my child, I have like this different mom power uh, when I bring it to sport. Um, and I, I feel like there's a lot of the, the positive things that could be touched upon after getting back into sport, even if it isn't at a high level. But um, yeah, I think this would be, I love hearing everybody's experiences and I would love to to contribute to something like that. Excellent. Thanks for sharing. Netflix, are you hearing us? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody have connections? I think that's a great idea. I love that. Thanks so much for sharing. Anyone else? There is a, during pandemic, there is, it's not an athlete, but it's a quadriplegic who had twins because with IVF, the chances were higher for, um, women to give birth to twins and she's a quadriplegic and she made a documentary about uh, her whole process um, in our disability and I don't think it's out for the public now because it's undergoing like all of the festivals and stuff and so it's a long process before it comes out to public but uh, her her name is Daniela Easy and she made a lot of um, kind of groups if you wanted to learn more about what the process of being pregnant being a quadriplegic would look like and the complications and how the uh, uh, physician would talk to her in terms of like it will have to be a c-section and then the studies on well women recover better from natural birth giving and yes there are risks maybe it will go to c-section let's see how this pan out and then the, the whole conversation is so 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 interesting and it evolving um but yeah it's, it's something else guys she's not an athlete uh, whatsoever so she's not returning this for she's just a quad that had twins and it fits to me it's it's just unbelievable it's crazy what's the name of the documentary do you know it's danny's twins danny's twins okay yes. excellent um elizabeth i see your hand up hi everyone my name's elizabeth i'm a uh, I guess once you're a Paralympian, you're always a Paralympian. I retired for a long time now. I was a swimmer. I'm a congenital um, double arm amputee, so kind of two short arms, two fingers on each side. 
And um, I went to four Paralympic Games at, um, as an athlete, and um, these conversations were never had. I'm very fortunate that my, my personal club and university varsity coaches were all um, stellar humans, and I could talk to them about this. Um, I don't think we've talked or um, any of the folks here have talked about um, actually using tampons. And that's something that it wasn't until I was hiking around Uluru or um, the colonial name is Ayers Rock after my third Paralympic games with my non-disabled twin sister and I had my period and I was really stressed out. Um, and I tell my twin everything in the world and I was really stressed out because for me getting a tampon fully inserted was really hard, still is at 47 years of age. Um, and, and sometimes I would have to miss swim practices. And I think I only disclosed to one of my club coaches that that existed and that it was hard for me. And yet as a swimmer, it's something that I needed to contend with. So I lived with, with not only menstrual kind of cramping pain, but also not properly, properly placed, um, tampons. So it's something that, uh, the system never talks about occupational therapists never spoke to me about it. Um, there were no assistive devices to help with that. Um, and, and then I watched this great documentary sometime in the last year by Ellie Simmons. It's on CBC gem, um, around, um, mall people I'll find the name of it of the documentary and I found out and I didn't even think about it that a lot of people um, with that disability also have a hard time um, with tampon insertion so it's a, a different side but if you're an athlete having to compete it's a real important side and then the other part I guess I wanted to talk about is when our bodies bloat and change with our cycles sometimes the clothing we have to wear when we're competing and training or being in certain environments is hard to navigate because it's sometimes very noticeable and um, some people make comments on it. But um, I'm so thrilled that this conversation is happening. So kudos to uh, Rugby, Rugby, Wheelchair Rugby Canada for doing this. Very, very cool. More so conversations excited. needed though, I think, yeah. That is, um, those are great points that, you know, I think many of us, um, are privileged to never really have to think about um, or consider. So thank you so much for sharing that experience. And it probably follows suit with a lot of of um, research and progress in in you know women's medicine that that there still hasn't really been a solution um, brought on for that that uh, piece of of products that work for people with disabilities or um, not being able to use the traditional products the same way so thanks for for bringing that up in the conversation um i think that's that's important and on the you know on the clothing piece we we had that um come up in our in our previous panel um you know swimmers as uh, track athletes um our ambulatory athlete was was sharing you know her personal struggle with with that and and um, I don't think it's it's um, near you know talked about enough as well as as how much that impacts um, you know our young athletes uh, well athletes of all age um, just you know what uh, what they compete in and um, how that can have so many different layers um, of things so that's her story to share but um, it has definitely come up um, in our circles yes Nandini yeah you know, I was just saying like. Uh, what she was saying was like a, a great point like your body changes so much in your menstrual cycle like I race in a skin tight chair like if I don't have the thinnest fabric I don't fit into my racing chair and it's not something that most people will notice the change in their body when they're on the period but like my hips will just get the slightest bit wider and when you're in a chair that is you're barely fitting in on a regular basis. When I'm on my period, I know exactly like how many days away I am just by the way that I slide into my racing chair. Or like you just there's so much to learn from that area of it. Especially when the chair is made to fit you in the most like aerodynamic way possible. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and not to mention what additional complications can come from a too tight chair and training that way, right? Um, so 
uh, just a, again, some great, some great additions that are being put into the chat. So um, I won't read them all, but please take some time. We'll we'll leave it open. Um, jo Joanna, um, I see your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to add to to those points really about nutrition through the cycle. And again, I think it's something we we don't talk enough about. And this isn't just for athletes, but for all of us, how different we can feel at each phase and. Often we, we think a lot about the symptoms through the bleeding point, but the amount of athletes I have that phase three, so post ovulation, who have really profound gastrointestinal symptoms, constipation, which can feel so sluggish, feel so bloated. I know I feel that, um, and I don't have to go and compete like a lot of you guys do. So, and the same perimenopause and menopause, actually using our nutrition can be such a, such a powerful thing and can be such a game changer. And I think. We don't talk about that enough with with all of us so um i'm happy to check in some stuff that i give to our athletes but yeah it can be that can be such a difference to changing some of those those symptoms um yeah i, I just think it's what we should we should certainly push more i mean sport and nutrition and and access to proper nutrition i think is always something that is um is a is a is a hot topic and this is for any athlete and um i forget the name of the nutritionist that was on the other panel nandini but we were talking about like calories in and calories out and how people keep you know counting the calories but it's actually more about fueling your body in a more kind of like you know um overall perspective that's the wrong word i was looking for but um Dr. Koros, I don't know if, you know, in your time at games and with, you know, working with the cafeteria food and all these kind of things that we face, if you've kind of seen like, you know, any of this stuff being impacted by, you know, whether it's cycles or just like, you know, the type of food and how, you know, people have maybe experienced different levels of of health because of, of what they may or may not have access to in, in a specific environment. Yeah, I feel like um, food kind of brings up a couple of thoughts for me. One, of course, when you travel, you have less control over what you're um, eating. You're sometimes at the mercy of what the hotel provides or what the games provides. Um, we're lucky enough at major games that most people can find some of the things that they like or enough to get through, but it's maybe not their optimal fueling strategies from home. I think the other thought that nutrition brings to me in a women's health space and specifically women with um, physical impairments might be around like a relative energy deficiency or, you know, that's kind of a hot topic in women's sport in general, not getting enough um, energy coming in for the amount of output that you're putting out. And it's much harder to predict in, in individuals with spinal cord injury, for example, we just don't have as much of a sense of like how many calories are you burning? Um, or even just monitoring and tracking weight to, you know, like uh, in in uh, ambulatory athletes, it, it might be easy to step on a scale and say like, oh, I've lost five pounds. Well, we should look at that and make sure that you're, you know, in a neutral energy balance. Um, so that definitely is something that I would love to see more research in and, and something that, that I struggle with um, is just trying to provide the same level of care that you would for able-bodied athletes when we do lack the, the research in in that area. And I think the other thing too is, you know, we talked about proper use of tampons and things like that, that, that is difficult. And so, you know, some of my athletes with disabilities might look more to ways to modify their cycle, like oral contraceptives, intrauterine devices. And some of those things make measuring the hormones that we use to look at energy deficiency uh, more challenging. So, um, I just think, yeah, like there's a whole bunch of challenges to to throw in there when it comes to food and nutrition in in women's health for sure. Awesome. I am just loving this conversation. Um, we had um, given ourselves until uh, I was going to say one thirty, but we're all in different zones, so fifteen more minutes. So bottom of the hour, and um, so I will kind of just again leave it open to these conversations, but. I would love, Meg, if um, there's a way to open up um, a channel or I don't know if people have, you can put your email in there. If people have like documentaries or links or resources they want to share, we have so many that have already come up in the chat and perhaps we can do a bit of a, a recap 
kind of post for our website that goes back out, um, you know, sharing some of these resources and some of the the highlights of today. I think that would be fantastic to just kind of keep the conversation going. And, and you know, I appreciate everybody that is shared in such an open way without, you know, any um, fear, I guess, or any kind of like boundaries around around what we're talking about. I think it's it's so important, um, and it's the only way that we can start changing the conversation. So, um, thanks uh, for that. And um, I just wanted to get that out before we kind of rush towards the end. But um, again, just opening it up for for more questions and conversations. And and if not, then I think we can start wrapping up. Uh, yeah, I'll just say really quickly, it's in the chat, um, but this recording will be going up on YouTube in the coming days. If anyone on camera, for whatever reason, is uncomfortable with it being published on the internet, send me a message and I can certainly just distribute this internally instead. Um, so just let me know. And then, yeah, like Fanny said, uh, I'll put my email in the chat, but you all should have it at this point. But please do send any further resources that we touched on today and uh, we'll do a follow up with um, all the documentaries and books and podcasts. I'm sure that we haven't tried on podcasts, but I'm sure there's a ton and uh, we'll share that and uh, we'll, we'll collate and share to our audience as a whole as well. So thank you, everyone. Yeah, there's there was a great question from from someone that had to leave um, who is a coach of climbing athletes in Squamish. I love that we got this type of reach, by the way, and that it didn't stay within our our community. Um, he says, I would love to know more about talking and planning with my athletes or training around their menstruation. There's good research coming out how to bet paradise and track the cycle. But being a man, I want to respect this topic and sometimes be sensitive. Um, I work with a lot of climbing athletes where how much body fat mass is a topic that's often discussed. So because of this, I know tracking, planning my athletes training around their cycle would be useful. I just want to know more about this topic. So um, he says maybe there'll be you'll be the answer in the recording later. So if someone has anything they they might want to add to this um, this question of his, uh, let's let's go ahead. If not, um, we can follow up with um, with some more information if if anybody has some. But I think, Dr. Cross, you kind of talked about that a little bit, but I don't know if if there's any any thoughts on that. Yeah, what I'll say is like it's still controversial and there's still like so much research that needs to happen that I'm not sure there is an answer. Like from my perspective, you know, my closing thoughts would really be like, I think this is the start, like to open the conversation. I, as someone who functions as a healthcare provider for female athletes and female athletes with disabilities specifically, have learned a lot from this conversation. So um, again, when you come as like an expert to a panel and you're learning, I just think that shows how far the conversation still has to go. And I would just want to encourage anyone out there to bring these questions and concerns to their healthcare providers, because sometimes we just, we don't know what we don't know. And, um, and I think you know, I, for one, am always game to try and problem solve things, as are most of um, the other providers that I work with in sport and outside of sport. So um, just really wanting to empower people to continue to have the, the conversations. Great. Thank you. So um, maybe we'll just uh, continue in that way and just get some closing closing thoughts from from our panel. Um, I'll go to Nandini because you're at the top of my screen. Oh, uh... I just thought this was amazing, like what Dr. Crows just said. I learned so much just by listening to people talk. And I love that I could be a part of this. Good call. Great. Thanks for joining. Um, Dr. Ann, uh, you're the next one on my screen. I'm just going to go in that order. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, first of all, thanks for inviting me to participate. I learned so much from being here as well. Um, I've always found that I learned so much from all of the people um, that I see in my clinic. And, um, you know, it's it's really an honor. And, you know, as you were saying, to have people talk about things that traditionally have been seen as more private, personal, or that they should have, for some reason, shame around when this is a normal part of half the human experience. And we can't get better at it until we start learning and really listening to what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, so I'm extremely appreciative, and, and thank you so much. No, thank you. Um, Dr. Izzy, you're next on my screen. Uh, really, just to echo as well what uh, Anne just said, it's really appreciate 
the invitation to talk and learning so much from from everything everyone's saying in particular I think it's great having um the the valuable in, insights from the athletes I think that uh as researchers we can often be somewhat removed and uh, it's really great to hear like on the ground what the what the problems are how they're overcoming things or what what really are in their thought processes and kind of keeping them up at night or make, it's great to hear the data-driven approach that, that Mel's using as well um, and hopefully as as researchers we're we're getting on it and pushing forwards as much as possible to give give you guys the better support uh, through evidence that you you really need. Excellent, thank you. We'll go to your research partner next. I'd love to see those napkin notes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> She's never going to forgive me for it. I said it's a <laughs> project, so one year later. Um, yeah, thank you so much for for letting me be on. It's it's been absolutely brilliant. Um, probably to answer my mum's question as well. Like tracking is tracking is everything. Um, from my experience, sometimes as females, we're, we're just as bad and don't know enough about our own bodies. And, you know, we can go through, you know, the amount of women I come to us and go, I didn't know that that part of me was called this. Or, oh, I didn't know I had an ovulation. My period's a surprise every month, you know. And, and actually, oh, yeah, I do have these symptoms. So tracking is absolutely everything because some women will breeze through cycle to cycle and feel absolutely no difference. But for, for me, I say if there are symptoms a resiliency strategy in and it's the same with menopause you know we're the ones who are feeling whatever it is we're feeling so put a resiliency strategy in whether it be from our mental health something that we train our training loads different we we tweak our nutrition at certain phases and that doesn't need to be fancy supplements um but you know find out what we're feeling and um you know allow us to, to train and perform at our best so yeah thanks thanks so much for having me today as well Thank you. Um, Melanie, c'est la dernière. So much pressure. <laughs> um, what, I, what I'm taking away from this is that it's been an hour and a half and this conversation could keep on going and we haven't even touched on much, all of the subjects yet. So this is a start, it's a beginning and I'm really, really excited to see what's happening in all of your areas. Um, what's going on in terms of accessibility, in terms of uh, women um, in sport, basically like uh, performance, uh, that, that side of it. And, and hearing you talk about um, when you went all through your own careers and, and seeing that gap and trying to um, bridge it. And I am inspired by this and uh, I am with men most of my days in my life and I needed this conversation so thank you everybody <laughs> amazing amazing well that I think wraps it up um on behalf of our GID group at Wheelchair Rugby Canada and Meg and myself thank you for joining us I am going to have a smile on my face for the rest of the day uh if what Mel says this is um really amazing and hopefully the beginning of some more regular conversations around this. Thank you and just a big thank you to Fanny for moderating. We could not have done this without her. <laughs> thank you Fanny. And yeah thank you to our panelists. Really appreciate again you guys all taking time out of your busy schedules. It's so nice to uh, meet some of you for the first time over Zoom or Microsoft Teams I should say and yeah just thank you so much and like Mel said like this conversation could keep going on and on and I think this is just scratching the surface and I'm eager to see where this goes. Well, as I said, this will be posted to YouTube in the coming days. I am going to go ahead and stop the recording and uh,